Good morning and welcome to Shattering Miss, a program devoted to the most important and the fastest growing segment of our society. To those who know that the world's political, religious, media, military, and economic institutions are corrupt, that they are counterproductive, that they cannot be fixed. Our mission, therefore, is to look behind the headlines, to know who is working against our interests, to understand why they are doing so. Because exposing and condemning errant and treacherous schemes isn't hateful, it is caring. No one knows this better than um, our uh, Friday uh, first hour guest he is IQ Al-Rasuli. Uh, it is a tremendous honor to have him uh, as a regular guest on this program. No one understands the nature of the Islamic religion and its consequence better than IQ Al-Rasuli. And the fact that he is willing to devote his time to educate us is a, not only an honor, but it's also a responsibility. Um, my hope is that all who listen to him become uh, ambassadors of the truth. And if there is a consequence, according to Yahweh, that's God's one and only name, of ignorance. He calls it death and destruction. He says that ignorance equates to death and destruction. And I think our guest, I.Q. Rasuli, would concur as it relates to Islam. That ignorance of Islam will lead to the deaths of countless people, already is, and the destruction of the world as we know it. What say you, I.Q.? Agreed, 100%. I can't add more to that. Yeah. Yeah, God's pretty smart. Uh, he, uh, In fact... Um, Later in uh, in this morning's uh, program, we're going to talk about what he predicted relative to Damascus some uh, 2,700 years ago and how it is all playing out exactly as he said it would uh, in uh, his prediction. But I would like to start in, uh, in Cairo. Uh, today in uh, Cairo, uh, at least five people were killed and uh, 50 others were mutilated. And uh, it appears that there is a mess now in Egypt that uh, is uh, essentially irresolvable. How do you um, view the situation in Egypt? I mean, I, but let me just preface it by saying my view is that is that they uh, they tried fundamentalist Islam with Morsi. It was a complete and utter disaster for everyone, and now they're trying a military dictatorship, and they are even more deadly. Uh, than, uh, than was the, uh, the government of uh, Morsi, particularly in allowing fundamentalist Muslims to attack and kill Christians. And that there really is no answer between uh, these uh, two extremes. It is very difficult to explain to European or American people that what we are dealing with is so evil and it's ingrained in the books that they are reading. The human beings themselves are not evil. They are not born evil. They are indoctrinated to be evil. Muslims are indoctrinated to be evil from the day they are born to the day they are dead. What do I mean by that? Yeah. They have to hate anybody who is not a Muslim. They have no choice. Everybody who is not a Muslim is called a kafir, an infidel, an unbeliever or kafirun in the plural. Mm-hmm. And Kafirun, we are only beasts to be slaughtered. That is exactly what the Qur'an says. That is exactly what the Qur'an tells the followers of Muhammad. That those who do not believe in Muhammad as a prophet and in Allah as his God, then they are only beasts to be slaughtered. And that's what they're doing, but they're doing it to each other as well. As to Christians, Jews, Buddhists and Hindus. It is a vile belief system. If you want to call it a religion, I have no problem with that. Whatever you want to call it, it is hate-mongering, war-mongering, misogynist, duplicitous, disloyal, intolerant, and has totally ungodly. Back to you, sir. Yeah, there's uh, two things that you mentioned there that I think are worth exploring. The first of those is that they're even, even killing one another. And the reason for that is the ninth surah of the Quran. In the ninth surah of the Quran, um, the Muslims by that time, that was the second to last surah uh, revealed, that uh, by that time, the Muslims had already overhunted the primary prey, which was their neighbor's caravans and Jews. 
They had raped all the Jewish women. They had enslaved all the Jewish children. They had robbed every Jewish home. There were no more Jews to uh, to ransack. And the every Muslim community, every excuse me, every Arab community within Camel Ride of uh, Mecca and uh, Yathrib, today's Medina, had been terrorized and robbed. And so they needed a new enemy. They needed a new foe to dehumanize, to uh, to rob. Uh, because that was the essence of the Islamic economy. And so the Ninth Surah tells Muslims, jihadist Muslims, that they are to slaughter um, non-jihadist Muslims uh, so that uh, Allah can take the peaceful Muslims and roast uh, them forever in the hottest places of hell. So Islam at that very moment in the Ninth Surah announced to um Two Muslims, jihadist fundamentalist Muslims, that a peaceful Muslim is their enemy. And so that is the basis of them killing one another, is it not? That is, yes, because the Sunnis consider the Shia infidels, and the Shia consider the Sunnis infidels. So as the infidels, they have to destroy them, and that's exactly what they do it. But it's even beyond that. Of course, that's the civil war we're going to consider in a moment in Syria, but it's beyond that. Um, for example, uh, Saddam Hussein, while he was primarily a secularist, um, because he was not a, de- a devout fundamentalist Muslim, he was still, if he were to, if he were to tell you what religion he was, he would still say, you know, he was a Muslim. Uh, Shisi, the, uh, the, the head of the Egyptian army, who is now head of the Egyptian government, is a fundamentalist Muslim. Uh, he is absolutely a fundamentalist Muslim, but by the Muslim, and he's of the Sunni uh, variety, but by the Muslim Brotherhood's standards, he's not a devout enough Muslim to impose Sharia law, and therefore uh, devout fundamentalist Muslim Salafs see him as the enemy. So it's not just uh, Muslims killing op- Muslims in a different sect, Shia and Sunni. It's Sunnis killing Sunnis because some Sunnis don't view other Sunnis as Islamic enough. Isn't that true? something that you said, uh, I think more to make a, a clarification. Sisi is not a moderate. He is more moderate than is uh, than are uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood. But he is not a moderate. When uh, Sisi was being trained by the United States, in the United States, uh, as a uh, potential uh, general for uh, the Egyptian uh, military, of which uh, the United States provides the equipment, uh, every survey of, of CC was to depict him as a absolute fundamentalist. He was chosen by Morsi, a fundamentalist, to head the military and to replace the generals who Morsi felt were too moderate. And so CC was chosen because he was the most fundamentalist of the generals available for, um, for Morsi to promote. So he was the favorite general on a religious spectrum by the Muslim Brotherhood. So he isn't even remotely moderate. He is just ever so slightly more moderate than are the Salafs, which are the resolute fundamentalists. Would you agree with that? Yes, but the question somebody would be asking us, why did he turn on them? Why did he turn on Morsi? I mean, he was chosen by Morsi. He is a fundamentalist. Morsi was a fundamentalist. So why did he turn on him? Yeah, there's a number of, of uh, uh, potential answers to uh, to that question, uh, none of which are really uh, germane because uh, his motivations don't change the uh, the reality that that the country has gone from a military dictatorship to a fundamentalist Islamic government back to a military dictatorship. That's the reality. 
But uh, there's a number of reasons that he would have done so. One is that uh, uh, the Egyptian economy under Morsi was an absolute shambles. It only survived because Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait provided billions of dollars. And Morsi, uh, at just before he was uh, deposed by the military, said that he wanted to send the Egyptian military to engage in the Syrian civil war to uh, fight and kill the Shia. And so the Egyptian military leaders knew that if they engaged and followed the directions of, of um, Morsi, that it would ultimately uh, destroy them. And so I think those are the primary two reasons that um, he turned on uh, the man that uh, appointed him. Now, there's a, there is always the third reason in Islam. You and I know that there's only one difference between Shia and Sunni Islam. And that's who's in power, who's in charge. The religion's identical. Who's in power, who's in charge. And so when it comes down to uh, Islam, where, uh, where dictators are the order of the day, who's in charge matters. And if one person can, can uh, elevate themselves above another, they're likely to do so, particularly when they're able to do so. Mm-hmm. For the Shia, it's a matter of survival. What I mean by this is, when the Shia under the Sunnis, the Shia are treated as garbage. Mm-hmm. When the Shi- Sunnis are under Shia, the Sunnis are treated as garbage. So there is no love between the two, ever. Yeah. It's never yeah. been since 1400 years ago. Yeah, there's only one respite from um, Sunnis killing Shia and Shia killing Sunnis. And the only respite is when there is a ruthless dictator, uh, typically a military dictator, that is residing over a country where there is a significant number of both Sunnis and Shias. And as was the case in Iraq, your country, under Saddam Hussein, under Saddam Hussein, why they did not get along, they were not killing each other. But you remo- remove the military dictator from uh, an Islamic country that is split among the two sects, and they become savages again. We're having a discussion with IQ Al Rasuli. He is the author of Lifting the Veil, the True Faces of Muhammad and Islam. You can buy his books at Amazon.com, and I would strongly encourage everyone to do so. Uh, IQ, at the end of our last segment, we, uh, we actually talked about what has caused the Syrian civil war, and we've, ca- we've talked about what caused the horrific destruction that uh, we have witnessed in your country, Iraq. America, stupidly went in and deposed a secular dictator who had kept relative peace between the Sunnis and Shias in his divided country and replaced it with a Shiite government controlled by Tehran and then provided weapons to both sides. So why are we surprised that there is a civil war in Iraq and now in Syria? You and I are not surprised. Americans are surprised. The world is surprised because they are ignorant. And as you said, the God, God said ignorance is criminal. Yeah. Well, he said it's, uh, it leads to death and destruction. Correct. Exactly. That's criminality. No. The uh, uh, sad situation here is that uh, this war that uh, is ravaging your country was literally caused because America deposed the secular dictator, Saddam Hussein. I want to reemphasize because it, it needs to be known that Americans always think that they did a good thing by ousting Saddam Hussein because he was a genocidal murderer of his own people. And very few understand the situation of the Kurds and why he killed 3,000 Kurds in the, uh, in the village. Were the Kurds that he killed, 
uh, loyal citizens that were just un- who were unarmed and just trying to go about their lives. And Saddam Hussein woke up one day and he said, you know, I think for fun I'm going to use some poison gas and kill these uh, people because, well, they're unarmed. It's going to be easy for me to do so. Is no. that the story? No, it wasn't. No, no, no. According to the facts of the story that these Kurds were joining and helping, aiding and abetting the enemy, Iran, against Iraq. They were all wielding weapons, weren't they? Yep. That and the weapons, were. yeah, the men were, and the weapons came from, um, from Iran, didn't they? And that not only did Iran recognize that the war, the Iran-Iraqi war, was a stalemate, and they they were unable to make any inroads in the, uh, you know, they were embedded in the south but couldn't press forward uh, towards Baghdad, that they came up, the Iranians came up with a strategy that if we arm the Kurds and get the Kurdy uh, Iraqis to uh, to form militia units to attack uh, Baghdad and uh, and Saddam Hussein, then we might be able to make progress by having a, a fifth column, a a uh, uh, a group of Iraqis who are, who are willing to war against Iraq. And that what I would and, like it, and it was six, yeah. yeah, sorry to interrupt, but I would yeah. like a mention to understand the Iranians didn't do it because they love the Kurds. No, of course not. They hate the Kurds because they have their own Kurdish problem. Mm-hmm. Turkey has a, its own Turkish problem. They did it because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. So they uh, they armed the uh, the Kurds, and the Kurds attacked uh, Saddam Hussein, and they were successful. Uh, and in fact, Saddam's uh, troops uh, could not uh, recapture the towns that uh, that they had uh, uh, attacked, and that. The only way to to successfully rid Iraq of what was now a very successful Iranian tactic was to deploy um, chemical weapons against the Kurds. By the way, who supplied those chemical weapons? Uh, Europeans and Americans. All right. So uh, the the uh, black mark on Saddam, his primary black mark, which is that uh, he gassed uh, his own people. That really isn't true. That to take that point of view, you have to be completely ignorant of the facts. Well, most people are ignorant of the facts. That's why they elected a person like uh, Obama. I mean, twice they elected him. I'm saying it in passing because it's a fact of life. We are facing a disaster. We are. Humanity is facing a disaster. And we were going to discuss it last time about Iran and the nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. Americans are not waking up to the fact that it is a disaster. You know, do not interfere into the internal affairs of Muslims. On the contrary, if you want to stop Islam, you've got to give them a very hard lesson, similar to the lesson that the Muslims have given to the Americans on 9-11. We have to do a reverse one. I don't, I don't know if you... Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to take a, a different point of view here. But first, I want to. Oh, we're, we're at the commercial uh, entry. We'll uh, we'll return to Shattering Miss after the commercial, and I'm going to share uh, first how it is now that Iran has become such a fierce enemy, and how they will soon become a, a nuclear opponent of Europe and the United States, directly related to the story of ousting Saddam Hussein, but also how we can give them. A stern lesson. Welcome back to uh, Shattering Miss. Uh, IQ ended the last segment by uh, suggesting that the way to uh, deal with Islam is to um, deal them a uh, a blow uh, as significant as the. Um, the blow that they dealt America of 9-11, where they flew planes into um, the World Trade Center, bringing them down, killing 3,000 people, and uh, a plane into the Pentagon, one to fly one into uh, the, the White House. They were symbolic uh, targets. They were deadly. Uh, and I told uh, IQ that I would provide uh, my compromise on, the, on that position. We don't have many suicide bombers in the United States. We're not particularly keen on hijacking uh, airplanes and, uh, and flying them into uh, buildings. Uh, 
and uh, I don't think that you ever prevailed by uh, um, taking yourself down to the level of your uh, your enemy when your enemy is uh, is uh, evil. But I do think there's three things we could have done um, in the wake of 9/11 uh, that would have eliminated the threat of uh, Islamic terrorism very quickly. And the first of those is I would have sent a, uh, a symbolic message. I would have dropped leaflets over the Kaaba, which is the, uh, the center of, uh, of Islam in, uh, in Mecca, where uh, the black rock representing Allah uh, uh, exists, where they go on their pilgrimage, where they bow uh, to every uh, day that they're, uh, they're being fundamentalist Muslims. I would have dropped leaflets on it and said, you've got um, 30 minutes to get the hell out of here because uh, we're going to... Uh, turn Mecca, the Kaaba, and the stone that is thought to be uh, Allah into dust. And uh, I would have absolutely obliterated um, the center of Mecca. Uh, and we've done that symbolically. You're going to bring down our buildings full of people. We're going to destroy your God. The, uh, the second uh, thing I would have done is I would have bluntly and boldly taken to the airways uh, and told the truth, to use the Islamic Hadith and Quran to expose Islam for the most repulsive, the most deadly, the most destructive dogma that man has ever conceived. And what that would have done is had very little effect in the Islamic world, but it would have had a huge effect outside the Islamic world, and it would have had a huge tendency to dissuade would-be suicide bombers from uh, acting out their religion in the West when they were exposed to the truth. And the third thing I would have done, is I would have stopped the funding and the arming of Islam. I would have ceased selling any Muslim country uh, American weapons, and I would have dissuaded other countries from selling the Islamic nation's uh, weapons, and I would have um, uh, seen to it that the Islamic uh, fiefdoms could not fund uh, uh, fundamentalist Islam and Islamic terrorism through OPEC, and that would have been the place where America's military could have made a difference. So that's what I would have done. What would you do? Well, you've you've done it all. I was thinking about obliterating Mecca. Yeah. All the time, but you you preempted me. Oh, okay. Sorry? No, no, I mean it. They destroyed the symbols of Western democracy and Western... Uh, Nominous in the economics. We should have done exactly the same thing to their system by destroying what is holiest to them, Mecca. Yeah. Well, it's actually there's two things we'd have to destroy to be effective. Mecca is one. That's the religious base. But there's a uh, militant military base of uh, of Islam, a power base, and that's the uh, almost exclusively through the deployment of American weapons. And so, uh, and the fuel that runs Islamic terrorism, that, that funds Islamic terrorism is OPEC. So it, if you hit economically, militarily, and religiously, uh, it would have been a blow that, uh, that Islamic terrorism could not have survived. In fact, Islam wouldn't survive. Correct. If you hit it all three ways, Correct. Islam wouldn't survive. In fact, what you said about declaring the facts about Islam mm-hmm. would obliterate Islam within a year. As a belief system, we're not just in killing people. Right. As a belief system, it will become a laughing stock to every human being. Right. And by the way, we have proof. We have proof of that. And the proof of that is that when um, in the 1920s, when the KKK Ku Klux Klan was exposed uh, and their internal documents were made public, it became impossible for them to retain members and to recruit new members, and they lost 97 percent of their members in two years. And I want to tell you, because Islam. Right, because right. the facts were revealed. Right. And Islam is right. Islam is far more vulnerable to the truth than uh, was the KKK. This is exactly why Muslims want to shut up people like you, like me, mm-hmm. and others who are telling the truth by either sh- uh, suing them to death financially or by massacring them. So, now I want to take your, uh, your thought one step further. By not doing what we, uh, we have uh, suggested, by not doing it. And by the way, this is not something that I'm saying here now or that you're saying here now after uh, uh, 10 years, uh, 12 years after 9-11, 13 years after 9-11. 
I wrote this in Tea with Terrace in the, in the fall of 2001. The main character in Tea with Terrace makes a presentation to the U.S. Congress, and he lays out exactly the same plan that I just articulated. So I wrote this and shared it with the American people um, 13 years ago. Now, the consequence of us not doing those things is that Islam will destroy the world as we know it. And that that uh, billions of people are going to die because uh, politicians and uh, the media, the military, chose to accommodate Islam, to arm Islam, to fund Islam, to praise Islam, as opposed to act in a moral, responsible, and uh, rational way against Islam. We can't blame the military in a democracy. We only blame the politicians who are the ones who are telling the military what to do. Even when the military are objecting, even when the military were telling Obama, don't do this and don't do that, he overruled them, even when they objected. So it's the politicians who are the guilty ones. Our politicians are guilty. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm with you halfway there. Uh, our politicians, like uh, in America, George W. Bush, who... Uh, made the decision to invade both Iraq and Afghanistan, both based on lies, making uh, the world infinitely less safe for having uh, done so. Uh, he bears more blame than does anyone in the world for uh, for the Iraqi civil war, for the Syrian civil war, uh, acting as the catalyst that's going to start World War III. I agree. But I will never exonerate the military because most of the military willingly supported this uh, call to arms, because that's what they do. And I've studied the U.S. military relative to its engagement in Afghanistan and Iraq, and it has been a very evil, duplicitous, counterproductive, and dishonest institution. This I cannot answer because you have, you are, you have more knowledge about this subject than I have. Yeah, but we're, we are in agreement that the principal blame, falls on the politicians who decided to deploy our military in a counterproductive way. Yeah, no question about that one. As far as I'm concerned, 100% they're guilty of mass slaughter. That is correct. We have uh, Glenn on the line. I'd like uh, Glenn to uh, be able to ask you a question, IQ. Go ahead, Glenn. Uh, good morning, Anna. Good morning, IQ. Um, good morning, I, I uh, originally called in when you were talking about uh, the attack, you know, our attacking Iraq. And one of the things that always uh, really uh, struck me about our uh, reinvolvement in Iraq in 2003 was that after all the destruction uh, that had been experienced in the 1990-1991 Iraq-Kuwait war and everything that went on there, the, the time between then and 2003, much of it was spent restoring uh, much of the infrastructure of that country. And by the time they were attacked again in 2003, they had just, just christened a brand new, uh, pardon the, pardon the choice. Yeah. Or they just, uh, initiated a brand new, I believe it was installed by the Chinese, a, a nationwide telephone system. They had a lot of infrastructure put back in place. Yeah, and we destroyed it. And the whole 2000, and we destroyed it, you know, after all those years of putting everything back in place, brand spanking new, as horrible as Saddam Hussein was, the, you know, the country, its infrastructure was built up. Uh, similarly to the, some of the amazing things that were done with Libya's infrastructure and some of their programs. Right. And, and so we basically, I, I, this makes me think about the beast in Revelation, uh, beast, um, that, oh, in Daniel's beast, uh, I guess, that stomps things down and stomps the residue and it rises not up again, you know. There's no Marshall Plan for these countries. They're not restored. There's the way the European infrastructure was after World War II, the way the Japanese infrastructure was after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. They're just smacked down and, and stamped into yep. the dust. Yep. In fact, uh, thank you, uh, Glenn, for, for that uh, those comments. Uh, Glenn's uh, insight here uh, falls uh, in line, um, IQ, with uh, something that uh, um, that I think is important to recognize. Militaries are conceived to kill and to destroy. That's all militaries do. They, uh, they destroy, they kill. And so we made a situation worse in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan by destroying their infrastructure, by destroying their government, and by killing their people. This was, there was nothing that could be gained by deploying a military in Iraq or Afghanistan. Agreed. The question is, what do we do now? 
Yeah. Well, the uh, what we should have done way back then is to uh, is to tell Americans the truth about Islam uh, and to deploy the plan that uh, you and I have just discussed. But since our government is is the problem, they're not just part of the problem. They are the problem. Exactly. Uh, they are the problem. Right that all we can do is to uh, do what we are doing and to encourage those who are listening, like uh, Glenn, uh, to recognize the true nature of this religion, to share it, to trumpet the, uh, the, this message, because if more people wake up, um, then we can prolong uh, our survival. Um, as it is now, um, there is no hope for us as, a, as the free world surviving even as much as uh, 20 years. My question to you, I need mm -hmm. your advice. Sure. I can understand Obama, 100% I understand him. Yeah. I say that not because of arrogance, I just understand him. Yeah. I understand... He was, he was taught, he trained, educated in an Islamic country. I mean, that's, he, yes, received, I he received an Islamic education, and then he, uh, he, after that he received a socialist, secularist, uh, politically correct education, and so he's easy to figure out. Not good... The more you know, the more you hate him, but he's easy to understand. So your exactly. question was going to be what? Why, did, why are the Russians and the Chinese, who are nearer to Iran, mm -hmm. helping Iran become nuclear? That I can't figure out. Oh, uh, when shattering this continues, IQ, I will be glad to answer that question. It is a wonderful question, and its consequence is so important for us to understand. Because in Iraq, in Syria, in Iran, we have the world divided. Russia and China on one side, Europe and the United States on the other. It is going to be the match that lights World War III. Shattering this, I'm your host, Yada. We have the foremost expert on uh, Islam in the world. Um, as part of this discussion, his uh, name is I.Q. Al-Rasuli. And I.Q. Uh, asked a question um, saying that he was uh, wondering why China and Russia uh, would not only ally with Iran, but would aid and abet the Iranian uh, nuclear ambition. And the, the answer is fairly straightforward. Um, it's, a, a, it's just a touch more complicated in Russia than it is in uh, China, but it's almost identical in both cases. Uh, in Russia's case, uh, the Iranians were the primary supporters of the Chechen Muslims uh, who were more vicious in Russia than they were uh, in the United States. Russia has a much bigger problem with Islamic terrorists than uh, uh, Europeans and uh, uh, the United States does. And combined with the, the fact that uh, Iran was doing this, uh, Iran uh, now has... Uh, access to what is the largest natural gas and oil reserves in the world, but landlocked, the Caspian Sea. Most of the, uh, of the oil reserves are in the very southern part of the Caspian Sea uh, along the coast of northern Iran. And so the Russians and the Chinese, the Chinese are tormented by uh, Muslims uh, in uh, the far southeast of their country as it borders Afghanistan, both made a deal with the Iranians that so long as they were uh, given the uh, pipeline rights to the oil and gas reserves in the Caspian Sea, they would uh, uh, ally with Iran, they would help Iran with its nuclear uh, ambitions, and that uh, Iran in turn would not only enrich them through a pipeline access to the Caspian Sea oil and gas reserves, but also uh, they would diminish uh, their support of the... Uh, Czechian Muslims in Russia, and uh, I'm not even sure I can pronounce the names of the uh, the Muslims in China. It does begin with an X. It has too many consonants for, for my uh, feeble tongue. Uh, but that's the answer. But it's so destructive. I mean, okay, on the, in the short term, I agree with them. They have some resources coming in. Mm -hmm. But in the not too insistent future, in five years' time, Iran with a nuclear weapon is a greater threat to them, and she will not be afraid with a nuclear weapon from continuing the terror from Chechnya or in northwest China. So where is the gain? I can't see any gain in the, oh, in the be, future. Be, because uh, 
Iran and China are allies because of the mutual benefit associated with the oil and gas. For example, Russia just signed a deal that takes uh, Iran just by that one deal alone back up to pre-sanctions uh, levels of trade of gas where they're trading uh, Iranian gas from the, the Caspian Sea for uh, um, Russian uh, goods, mostly uh, weapons. Uh, and it's, uh, it's in the multiple billions of dollars a day. It's, it's an enormous uh, trade arrangement. Uh, and the most expensive pipeline in the world is the one that the United States built for China, linking China to the Caspian Sea. These countries now are symbiotic. Their, their economies have become wholly dependent upon one another. It's just like China is never going to attack the United States because its economy is, uh, requires the United States as a customer. Iran's never going to deploy its nuclear weapons against Russia or China because it requires the goods coming from Russia and China for its oil to survive. And so it's not going to deploy its weapons there, and, uh, and, but it will deploy its weapons in Europe and the United States, and uh, I, I don't believe they will do so in Israel, even though they talk about it. So the loser in this game is the United States and, and uh, Europe, uh, where there is a beneficial um, relationship, uh, greedy as it might be, um, ultimately destructive to the world, as it might be, between China, Russia, and Iran. I hope you are wrong. <laughs> but it sounds right. No, no, I'm yeah. not saying it, because yeah. uh, it, it yeah. is really, really... You cannot trust Shia Muslims. In fact, the whole concept of Taqiyya started with Shia Islam. Mm -hmm. Taqiyya is Islamic sanctioned subterfuge. Right. It started with the Shia Muslims. Right. So to, to trust Rouhani or uh, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei with anything is literally out of touch with reality. Right. But, you know, Putin's an ex-communist. Uh, communism, uh, and so are the leaders in China. Communism is guided by Machiavelli, uh, where the ends justify the means. It is a completely amoral and immoral philosophy. And so they aren't trustworthy either. And so you have a yoke of, uh, of equally untrustworthy uh, individuals and nations, but all temporarily uh, benefiting one another. And the consequence, of course, is going to be lives of billions of people around the world. Because this is leading to World War III. And it is no unavoidable. Yeah, unavoidable. We'll be back. Thank you, IQ. We'll be back after the news and commercial break.